This is another video to support an introductory proof writing class. And here we want to look at conditional statements, biconditional statements, and compound statements. So we'll start with conditional statements. So let's suppose that P and Q are mathematical statements. So we looked at the precise definition of a mathematical statement in the previous videos, so check those out if you need to. And then we have the truth of P guarantees the truth of Q. So there are a bunch of equivalent formulations of that. And maybe the one that is most common is if P then Q. So this says if we know P is true, then Q also must be true. Then here are some other formulations. So P implies Q, or sometimes with symbolic notation with this like double arrow thing. And then Q if P is also equivalent. P is a sufficient condition for Q. That's another way of saying it. And then Q is a necessary condition for P. That's another way to say it. So maybe let's think about this one for a little bit. So Q being a necessary condition for P, that means that Q is necessarily true if P is true, which notice that is equivalent to these things up here. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of examples. So maybe the first example I wanna look at goes like this. If f of x is a polynomial, then f of x is continuous. So in this case, our statement P would be f of x is a polynomial. So let's maybe point that out. So here's P, and then our statement Q would be f of x is continuous. So here we have P implies Q. It's well known that every polynomial is continuous. So let's maybe do another one. So let's say if N is a multiple of six, then N is a multiple of two and three. So maybe that's a shorthand way of saying that it's a multiple of two and it is a multiple of three. So let's see here. In this case, the statement P is this thing. N is a multiple of six. And then our statement Q is this thing right here, which is N is both a multiple of, P, or of two and three. Okay, so next we wanna maybe look at the truth table for a conditional statement, and then we'll talk about the converse and how the converse is not always true. So here's the truth table. So we need inputs P and Q, and then we need an output P implies Q, like that. So that's a general setup for a truth table with this conditional setup. So let's see, P could be true or false, and then Q could be true or false. And they don't necessarily depend on each other in order to get this truth table written down. Okay, so if P is true and Q is true, well then that means P implies Q is a true statement because the truth of P implied the truth of Q. So here we have this is a true statement. Now, the truth of P here did not imply the truth of Q because we have P is true and Q is true, making this a false statement. So in that case, P did not imply Q. But now these are both true, kind of vacuously, because our statement P implies Q didn't even get a chance to start because P was false to start with. And remember, our statement P implies Q kind of assumes that P is true. So like I said, these two down here are vacuously true. So that tells us that our truth table goes like that. So it's true, false, true, true. Now next what we wanna do is talk about the converse real quick. So the converse of P implies Q, so maybe we'll write it like this, we'll have P implies Q, and then we'll have a little squiggle to say that we're making the converse here. That turns into Q implies P. 
key. So it just changes the direction of the arrow. So it's like we're going in the opposite category or something. Okay, so let's maybe think about the converse of these two statements and decide whether or not they are still true. So notice this one's definitely true because if F is a polynomial, then F is continuous. Well, let's take the converse of this thing. So let's maybe color code this in this light green. We'll bring this light green star down. This says if F of X is continuous, then f of x is a polynomial. But we know for a fact that that is not true. There are a ton of continuous functions that are not polynomials. So while the statement p implies q is true, the converse q implies p is not true. Now let's look at this second one. Maybe we'll color code this one in pink, kind of looks like the red, but that's okay. And this would say if n, is a multiple of two and three, then n is a multiple of six. Now we took the converse of this pink starred statement, and I wanna notice that in this case, our statement is still true. So sometimes the converse is true, but not always. And when it is true, this is known as a biconditional statement. And that's something that we'll look at next. So I'll go ahead and clean up the board, and then we'll start with biconditional statements over here. Now let's look at what the notion of a biconditional statement is. So again, we wanna suppose that P and Q are both mathematical statements, and a biconditional statement means that P implies Q and Q implies P. So we've got the implication is true and the converse is true. In other words, the truth of P and Q are equivalent. And here's some like equivalent formulations, like some other ways you might see it written. And so P if and only if Q, that's like a standard way that you might see it written in a textbook when you have an if and only if theorem. Or P, I just read this as if and only if Q. Well, that means P implies Q and Q implies P. This is a symbolic way of doing it with this like double arrow. Um, and then P I F F Q. So I F F is a shorthand for if and only if. So again, if you're like doing a first draft of a proof or something, you might use one of these. But again, when you write it up in the end, you always wanna use complete sentences. And then finally, P is a necessary and sufficient condition for Q. That's another way of write it, writing it. So this is not at all an exhaustive list, but this at least gets you started thinking about equivalent formulations of this biconditional statement. So now let's look at some examples. Maybe we'll start with one that was on the last board, but we will rephrase it as a biconditional statement. And that is, N is a multiple of six if and only if, it is a multiple of both two and three. Okay, so we saw that though both the conditional statement and the converse were true on the last board. That makes this biconditional statement true. So let's maybe look at another one. So let's suppose that F is F from R to R is everywhere differentiable. So this is maybe like a starting hypothesis just that is looming over the whole setup. And now we're ready to look at our biconditional statement. And that is F has a local extreme value at A if and only if F prime of A equals zero. So from like calculus one, it's well known that if you've got an everywhere differentiable function, then it gets its local extreme values only at the critical points. Those critical points are where the derivative is zero or does not exist, but we're looking at only everywhere differentiable functions. That means the, the derivative would be zero. So there are two examples of some true if and only if statements. So you could write some false ones as well. Like if we took our first example on the last board and turned it into an if and only if statement, that would be a false if and only if statement. So now let's maybe go ahead and look at the truth table. So the truth table here is pretty boring because P and Q are equivalent statements. So the truth of P is equivalent to the truth of Q and the falsity of P is equivalent to the falsity of Q. So here, let's say we would have columns 
P, Q, then we would have a column P if and only if Q. Great, so we need true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. So like I said, the two statements are equivalent. So true if and only if true, and then false if and only if false. So that means those two are true, but then these two in the middle are false. Okay, good. So there's one last thing that we want to do, and that is do some experiments with compound statements. Like look at the arithmetic of these logical statements now that we have all of them, as well as some truth tables. So we'll finish off this video with a couple of those examples. So I want to finish off looking at some compound logical statements. And what I mean by compound is like, say we've got multiple statements and we combine them using our logical operations that we defined in previous videos. So like the and rule, the or rule, and the not. So we denote those by like this P wedge Q, this P and then like maybe this upside down wedge Q or this like twiddle P for not. And then I'm gonna like state De Morgan's laws, we'll maybe prove one of them, but if you're in my class, you'll prove some of the others for group work in class. So here we have not P and Q, that's equivalent to not P or not Q. So we've got this distributive rule of not across like the and operation. You've got a similar distributive rule of the not operator across the or operation. So notice it flips the or to an and. And then next we've got a distributive rule of the and across the or operation. So we've got P and the quantity Q or R, that's equivalent to P and Q or P and R. And then there's one more, which is a distributive rule of the or operation over the and operation. I'll let you guys think about what that is. So now let's look at an example. So let's say, we want to create some sort of logical operation that tells us when exactly one of P or Q is true. So that's what we want to do. And notice that we don't have one operator for that. And that's because this or is not what is sometimes called an exclusive or. It's possible for P and Q to both be true and that creates something true here. Okay, so let's maybe see how would we, we would want to do this. How we'd want to do it is like this. So we have P or Q. So that means that P could be true or Q could be true or they both could be true. But we want to eliminate the possibility that both are true. So we do an and conjunction with not P and Q. So let's read this off. So P or Q is true and they are not both true. Okay, so let's maybe look at the truth table for this and then we can see that this produces the right thing. So let's do P, Q, and then we'll build up all of the parts. So P or Q and then we need P and Q not P and Q, and then finally our ending thing, which is P or Q, and not P and Q, like that. Okay, so those are all of the columns that we need. So let's maybe fill in all of the details. So let's see, we could have true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. Okay. So filling in the or and the and is easy because we've kind of done that before. So let's maybe do that real quick. Okay, so we've got the or and the and filled in. Now we need to take not of P and Q in parentheses. So that's just gonna negate all of these. So here we'll have false and then we'll have uh, true, true, true. Good, so that's the negation of everything in there. Okay, so now we wanna put which two columns together? Well, we need to put these two columns, this one and this one together with an and statement. So in order for it to be true, both of them need to be true. So let's see, we've got true and false, that's gonna give us false. True and true, true and true, so that's gonna give us true and true. False and true, that's gonna give us false. So we've created exactly what we want. 
we have a false outcome if both P and Q are true. And then we have a true outcome if only one of them is true. And then a false outcome if they are both false. So that's exactly what we wanted. Okay, so maybe we'll go ahead and stop here because checking all of these other things like De Morgan's Laws really comes down just to setting up a truth table just like we did right here and making kind of the truth calculation on both, both sides of this equal sign and seeing that we get the same outcome. Okay, that's a good place to stop.